Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Science of Alternative Protein Seminar, uh, the APAC edition. We are super excited that you are joining us today to learn about um, seafood cell line cultivation. Um, in this seminar series, we host alternative protein researchers in the APAC region to share research advancement and significantly help the alternative protein community identify underexplored technical questions that will help drive the field forward. We hope this series will serve as a platform for exchanging ideas and facilitating collaborations among researchers in alternative proteins. My name is Wasamon, your host for this series. I'm the science tech specialist with the Good Food Institute APAC. We work with scientists from industry, academia, and government bodies to address technical gaps in the alternative protein productions in the APAC region. Um, for today's session, I'm going to start with a quick announcement, and then I will introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Mark Richards. Um, Dr. Richards will then present for the next uh, 40 minutes, and then we will conclude the session with a 20 minutes Q&A period. So um, before we dive in today, uh, just a quick um, point on the nomenclature. You, some of you may know that at the SIAW, we have announced that GFI APAC have worked with 36 key stakeholders from across Asia Pacific to align on the word cultivated as a preferred nomenclature to describe food products grown directly from animal cells. So while we know that some researchers and companies have used other terms in the past, cultivated is what we will be using throughout this conversation. Um, and I would like to point out uh, a few functionality on the Zoom webinar in case some of you may not be familiar. On the bottom of the screen, you will see the chat and Q&A buttons. We encourage you to use the chat function to introduce yourself and other participants However, please make sure you direct your questions for Dr. Richards to the Q&A window so we catch all your questions and address them. Um, in addition, in the Q&A section, you have the option to upvote specific questions that you would like to be answered first so we can prioritize the questions that are most relevant to the audience today. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Mark Richards. Mark is an embryonic stem cell biologist by training. He completed his bachelor degree with honors and PhD at the National University of Singapore. Currently, he leads the life science research team at Nanyang Polytechnic. Mark is well trained in primary cell culture strategies, cell characterization techniques, and animal free media development. He was responsible for developing the world's first xenofree human embryonic stem cell lines for regenerative medicine early in his career at the National University of Singapore and ESL International. More recently, he has been working in the cell act space, developing solutions to address costs and technical hurdles which affect the cultivated meat industry. Mark is a recipient of a Singapore Food Story theme to seed grant for aquatic species, cell line, and low-cost media development. He is also a collaborator in Singapore A-Star Crips Meat Consortium. Umami Meat is his, his close industry collaborator. Mark also has research interest in the aqua, aquaculture space. Apart from uh, cell act research, he has funded research projects on mud crab um, and white trim indoor position and intensive farming system. So we are very excited to have Mark with us today. Um, with that, Mark, uh, feel free to take it away. Right, so um, very good morning to everyone. I hope I'm clear enough and um, you can all hear me uh, well. So I'm Mark Richards from uh, Nanyang Polytechnic and I'm uh, really very grateful to GFI and Wasamon for the invitation and opportunity to share on my research in the cultivated meat space today. Um, the title of my presentation is Overcoming Some of the Technical and Cost Hurdles of Cultivated Seafood, and I really hope that what I have to share today uh, will be of interest to you. 
So uh, this is the overview of what I will be covering today. I'll spend a, just a couple of minutes, uh, you know, um, elaborating on some of the very exciting developments that we have ongoing in Singapore, particularly uh, in the cultivated meat space. And then I'll go into uh, some of the work that we have done at Nanyang Polytechnic on um, aquatic species cell line development. Um, low-cost uh, fetal calf serum replacements, and finally, um, some of the work that we have also uh, accomplished on developing hydrogels and scaffolds for uh, aquatic species cell lines. So this is the uh, Singapore scene today. There's uh, pretty good government support in the form of uh, alternative protein research grants, and uh, we also have a very progressive regulatory framework um, in the area of novel foods. As you may already know, uh, Singapore is the first country in the world uh, to approve a cultivated meat product. And by this, I refer to uh, Eat Just uh, Good Meat, the chicken from Eat Just. So um, government support is uh, very good. And we also have a vibrant uh, ecosystem uh, in Singapore, a cultivated meat um, ecosystem in Singapore. The companies listed here are homegrown Singapore startups in the cultivated uh, meat space. I think they're at least nine or ten of them, and at least four are focused on aquatic species um, cultivated meat uh, ideas. So that includes Fisheroo, a new company called Marinus Bio, Shok Meats, probably the uh, most established of the uh, Singapore cultivated meat companies, and my close collaborator, Umami Meats. So these are some news clippings from local media. Um, Shok Meats, of course, is a... Um, it's the first cultivated meat startup in Singapore and they specialize in crustacean cells. They've done quite a lot of uh, tasting and I think they've moved into lobster, crab and you know, uh, not just shrimp uh, these days. And good meat here, it's uh, available and accessible on several platforms in a variety of food products, in a variety of food establishments from a private members club um, and even down to a you know a pop up they had in a local Singapore hawker centre. Hawker culture is uh, quite a thing in Singapore, so a variety of uh, products priced at different levels uh, available and quite accessible today uh, in Singapore for good meat. I took these pictures myself. Um, these are pictures of good meats um, products. Two of them: um, chicken salad and chicken dumpling. Um, I got them on a delivery platform. So, you know, they've even gone into uh, the food delivery uh, platforms in Singapore. Singapore is also um, home, you know, to the world's first commercial cultured meat, uh, cultivated meat production facility. And, you know, there are many more of these uh, facilities starting up. Esco Esther is also a homegrown company which um, yeah, initiated this and uh, they also... Uh, they, they also produce quite a few biohazard hoods and, and clean rooms. Personally, um, I work very closely with Umami Meats, which is a Singapore-based cultivated meat startup specializing in aquatic species cultivated meat products and platform technology development. Umami Meats has made several breakthroughs in the, in, 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 in the last year, and um, they have also organized uh, you know, many tasting events for some of their food products. And finally, you know, Singapore also has a very progressive novel food safety framework. The Singapore Food Story funding platform uh, funds not just projects in terms of uh, product, uh, in technological, uh, 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 looking at the technology of, uh, of alternative protein, but they also, they also fund um, research into uh, the safety of uh, novel proteins. And there's a, I would say, a, um, uh, uh, an office called Fresh, uh, which has been tasked to actively look into uh, some of these safety issues. And we have a new uh, guidelines that have been recently issued by the uh, Singapore uh, Food Agency, a new set of requirements for novel food product approval. And there's an abridged version, a set of guidelines that is in place for sensory studies and tastings of these novel food products. So the documents are available uh, at these links. You can submit, they even have a portal dedicated uh, for submission of these dossiers and um, they give you a, a timeline uh, in which they, you will get a response from them. So I think, um, you know, the Singapore Food Agency should be commended for uh, taking the step forward and, you know, being uh, leaders in this area. I never thought it would happen in Singapore, uh, but it has. So coming to what 
I do, right? Uh, my research principally focuses on three areas. So the first area is on developing cultivated meat uh, cell lines from high value and unfarmable aquatic species. And uh, what we are doing here is to look at uh, um, deriving muscle precursors and uh, cell lines uh, from not just high value species like grouper, snapper, but also species which cannot be farmed and are still predominantly wild caught. Unagi is quite a, is, is one such example which we have worked in. Um, we also want to work on protected species such as ras. Uh, and I think if you come to Asia, uh, the situation in East Asia is such that we consume really a wide variety and a plethora of uh, you know different seafood species, quite different from the West, where you know you probably have salmon and some white fish. You know, honestly, if you you really don't need to go to Japan, any um you you see a huge variety of fish and crustacean species sold at almost every wet market in East Asia. So some of the species which we have worked with and you know which we are interested in going into include um, cephalopods. I think they are interesting species. They don't really have a uh, skeletal structure. Um, uh, so it'd be nice to work on these um, protected species, another area, and we have worked on these two, unagi and a very expensive, um, high-value grouper species called the panther grouper. In terms of um, plant-derived calf serum substitutes, the motivations here are, of course, to lower uh, the cost of production. So we are looking at low-cost plant-based serum substitutes, as well as uh, plant sources to, to replace basal media. Particularly, we are interested in the plant 2S albumins and plant transferins. Uh, we have uh, worked on material from legumes as well as yeast, uh, but uh, exploring um, plant substitutes from fungi and algae as well. And even better, if we can have a media from a byproduct of the food manufacturing industry uh, that can be upcycled into a uh, replacement, uh, media replacement or serum replacement. The third area is essentially that of uh, hydrogel supports for cultivated meat and scaffolds. It's a smaller focus that we have. The motivations are to um, show uh, proof that we can produce a self-assembling a scaffold. We initially started this work not wanting to look at polymeric scaffolds. We wanted a scaffold which could be easily removed from the cells which are growing. So we were looking at self assembly, self -ass uh, small peptide molecules which could self assemble and form hydrogels. Um, here we want to look at natural and edible carboxylic acid groups as capping groups. And as I mentioned, a scaffold which could easily be removable. I'm not sure if that would be possible eventually, right? And of course, um, one of our major drivers here is we were looking at scaffolds which are of non-animal origin. So my collaborators, of course, as I've mentioned and what someone has in her introduction, we work very closely with Umami Meats. Um, we are also part of the Chris Meats Consortium at the Bioprocessing Technology Institute in Singapore. And I have a close collaborator in the National University of Singapore as well. We are very grateful to Singapore's uh, ASTAR, the Agency for Science, Technology and Research for funding um, this project. It represents 18 months of work on this grant uh, and we have just uh, completed this. So uh, whatever comes next in my slides is the outcome of this uh, Singapore Food Story uh, Team 2 seed grant, which ran for 18 months. So moving to um, fish cell lines or pea science cell lines, we have worked with unagi, and this is probably one of our um, most ideal and probably the best performing cell lines which we have. Unagi is unfarmable, and this article from the local newspaper, Straits Times, uh, tells of how the Japanese have tried for many years to complete the life cycle of unagi in captivity, but have been unsuccessful. So all the unagi that you get, all the unagi kabayaki that you get today is essentially wild caught or, you know, um, juveniles harvested from the wild, put in pens and, and grown to adult size. Um, in the near future, and we are already, um, you know, going into um, this, this part of our work, uh, we want to look at endangered species and, and whether or not, you know, several endangered species are actually consumed 
aquatic, and, uh, endangered aquatic species in, in, in this part of the world. There's wrasse, uh, sharks fins, a uh, whale, you know, and even sturgeon, right? Um, so um, moving forward, of course, with the right uh, approvals in place, we would want to look at uh, the endangered species much more closely. So coming to um, some of the experimental data that we have, this slide summarizes what we have done um, for unagi, a Japanese eel. So we procured eels from a um, uh, Japanese fish supplier in Singapore, and we developed a protocol in which to extract out these uh, muscle progenitors and also a differentiation protocol to differentiate um, these progenitors into more mature muscle cells. Um, this is an enlarged image of um, uh, this section of the, the picture here, and you can see the striations on um, some of these unagi muscle cells that we have. The unagi cells, in terms of characterization, they do stain for your typical mature muscle markers like uh, myosin heavy chain 1. MF20 um, is also a, a type of myosin. One of the issues which we have faced in um, working with fish cell lines is that you know, a lot of the commercially available uh, antibodies which would work for um, muscle antigen, uh, muscle proteins uh, from on, in, in, in the vertebrate area don't seem to work quite well on, on, on fish species. So we went on to further characterize uh, the differentiated uh, unagi uh, cells. So here we use RNA-seq for transcription profiling and we compared the transcription profiles of the myoblasts with the unagi myocytes. And indeed, we do we can see upregulation of uh, muscle-specific genes upon uh, differentiation. Uh, for example, myoD and myogenin are upregulated in um, the differentiated unagi myocytes. So in terms of the protocol which we used, it's a uh, standard, it's, uh, well, we have adapted it a little, but it generally involves a uh, low serum and with supplementation of ascorbic acid. Or serum, not entirely essential, uh, but it does improve uh, the yield of uh, differentiated uh, muscle cells uh, at 1% to 2% um, in horse serum. We wanted to see how far these unagi myoblasts could retain uh, their differentiation potential into mature myocytes after serial passages, after numerous serial passages. So uh, this diagram essentially shows the unagi cells at different passages, 3 to 12, and um, differentiated. And staining for myosin, as you can see, um, up to passage 12, um, there is still a fair amount of myosin staining, but um, you could also notice that the degree of intensity of myosin tends to drop uh, after every serial uh, population doubling and every serial passage of these uh, unagi myoblasts. We evaluated different extracellular matrices to see if they could support and promote unagi muscle or unagi myoblast differentiation. Um, the picture over here is that of uh, uncoated uh, dishes. Then we used gelatin, fish collagen, also derived in-house from discarded fish scales, and finally laminin. I think by far we find that laminin is probably the best extracellular matrix for uh, myoblast differentiation because the fibers or the more mature muscle cells on the laminin surface are a lot thicker uh, in, in form and nature. Apart from unagi, we have also worked on a variety of other uh, tropical uh, pea sign of fish species. Uh, this is a grouper, uh, common tropical species a very costly, high-value type of grouper as well. They called it the panther grouper and red snapper. So these lines are capable of um, myocyte differentiation at the early passages, but uh, over extended passage, they tend to lose that uh, phenotype. So some of the line, these lines have also been immortalized, um, over 200 population doublings without any slowing down in their, in their doubling time. And they're pretty robust and efficient in culture, a doubling period about 24 hours or so. The protocol which we use to establish these um, fish cells, uh, we basically isolated 
biopsies from juveniles and then um, subjected these uh, tissue biopsies to both trypsin and collagenase 2 and 4 digest, followed by a pronase digest and filtration through a, a cell strainer, 40 micron cell strainer. The media we use is L15. Um, and in the initial primary cultures, we did supplement with uh, calf serum and BFGF. The L15 enables us uh, not to rely on CO2 uh, to maintain the pH of the, um, uh, the media. So it's actually uh, quite good in that sense. And we can keep the cells at about 24 degrees um, centigrade. That's the culture temperature. We experimented with both explants and cell suspensions, but I think um, cell suspensions have a little bit of edge uh, when it comes or perform a little bit better when it comes to the derivation of these uh, muscle and fin cell lines. So this protocol, um, we adapted and tweaked a little bit, but um, it's essentially based on um, this publication in the Journal of uh, Visualized Experiments over here. So we wanted to see if we could scale up sufficient cell biomass with these fibroblasts, uh, which grow quite well and efficiently. Uh, we are lucky in Nanyang Polytechnic to have a uh, Paul Cooperation Center, which has bioreactors for this kind of work. And uh, we use the expansion system from Paul, uh, which is very economical on media usage to scale up a large number of these uh, uh, fish cells. and um, we also uh, have uh, capabilities in the school to turn biomass that's been scaled up into prototype uh, food products. So we have a food product development team, a um, you know a cell line um, focus as well as uh, that's I'm part of that, and we have my colleagues who can develop food products, and we also have a food safety uh, arm uh, in the school as well. So this was done for uh, one of our collaborators. So the next question that we um, wanted to look at is whether or not the culture conditions that we used and was good and performed well for both freshwater and saltwater bony fish, could these culture conditions be used and you know, be adapted or be immediately transferable to cartilaginous fishes like uh, rays, sharks, and, and sturgeon? given that the blood of uh, bony fishes is hypoosmotic in relation to salt water, whereas uh, cartilaginous fishes have a different osmoregulatory system. Um, the blood in these fishes is, a lot, is, is either uh, isoosmotic or hyperosmotic compared to seawater. So we write this out um, using explant cultures from uh, cartilaginous fish. These are the placoid scales, which are typical of um, uh, cartilaginous fish. And while the explant cultures did grow and we could establish primary cells, um, um, what happened was that after a, a period of time, using the same culture conditions that worked for the grouper species, Unagi and the red snapper, we found that um, the cartilaginous fish cells developed quite a lot of vacuoles. And anyone who's um, you know has some knowledge on cell culture will know that this is not a good sign, right? This phenotype obviously shows that the cells are not doing well; they're under some kind of stress and are probably going to undergo senescence soon. So what we did was to adjust the osmolarity of the culture media with sodium chloride, and you know within a short period of time, um, the phenotype, this speculated phenotype, uh, disappeared from the the cell. So. Uh, we didn't need to use urea, which is sometimes used in um, attempting to in, in attempts right to culture cartilaginous fish cells. So just adjustment with osmolarity uh, worked quite well. We did not have to alter any other protocols or, or still reliant uh, essentially on the L15 um, basal media with uh, adjustment to with osmolarity with sodium chloride. So. Moving on to the uh, second part of my um, uh, presentation, and that is on plant-derived serum and media substitutes. So here, obviously, the um, uh, motivation is to get rid of um, calf serum entirely from the equation. And um, you know, it's something which I worked on many years ago 
um, in the embryonic stem cell area. Uh, and it's something that has come back in big way uh, in the cultivated meat space as well. So we have had success with a variety of pulses and legumes um, in developing these serum and culture media substitutes, as well as okara, which is a byproduct of soy milk and tofu production. So we have developed a way in which to extract, um, to make extracts from both legumes and okara, and we have evaluated uh, some of these extracts, um, about nine of them, from different plant source materials on a cell line, a robust cell line that which we developed as well, a grouper cell line. So uh, what we did was to screen these grouper cells against extracts from various plant species, nine of them, and we gradually reduced the fetal bovine serum in the media from 10% to 2.5%, replacing it with extracts of various plant species, two passages at each reduction and each dilution of the calf serum. We also evaluated subtilicin. We digested the plant material, the subtilicin, to see if that could produce a serum replacement, which would be uh, more efficacious, more, more uh, better in performance. The thinking here is that subtilicin could help uh, liberate, liberate some of the smaller peptides, uh, which would otherwise, and increase the bioavailability of uh, general macronutrient content uh, to the cells. So um, we gradually uh, reduced the serum concentrations. And in total, we screened about nine different pl plant source materials, mainly from beans and pulses and yeast extracts as well, and two plant sources of valorized origin. There's some evidence that um, subtilicin digestion can improve nutrient bioavailability and increase the performance of these, uh, what we term the plant-derived serum or PDS uh, performance. And we have one or two candidates which, have, which are performing very well still. And a, a, we filed a patent for, for, for this uh, uh, invention as well. Um, so what we wanted to do was to see how low we could go right, uh, in the removal of the calf serum. So uh, again, uh, adaptation, sequential adaptation to increasingly lower concentrations of fetal calf serum. So this is one of our plant extracts, which uh, we term PDS1. Con and this figure over here on the left, A, 10% fetal calf serum control, reduced 2.5 um, FBS control. And you can see this is quite sparse over here but with an addition of 7.5% um, of this plant serum, we see improved growth. And we've pushed this down uh, even further. 1% FBS control, 1% FBS supplemented with 9% uh, of PDS1. Again, there's improvement in growth and more cell numbers here. Addition of ITS does improve and does help um, speed up the growth and the increase in cell numbers is um, quite evident uh, with respect to the control and uh, the test arm over here. And so addition of ITS does help, but um, you know I think with the 9%, it's quite um, good. And we're trying to push this down even further to less than 1% FBS. So what we find important in this is that the preparation protocol of these plant serums is important, particularly the dilution factor, because we find that if we if, if the plant extract is too concentrated, uh, there's a uh, the cells don't quite like it, right? For for some reason, it could be because of the anti nutrient content or something inside. So the dilution factor is quite important, and it varies uh, from different plant extract to plant extract. Blending of these different plant extracts um, can improve performance overall, um, but ultimately as well, cell lines need to be adapted from serum to low serum and possibly even to no serum conditions via uh, you know, clonal selection in the future. Yeast extracts, we got these yeast extracts uh, from a collaborator. So some yeast extracts were supportive, uh, supportive, and some um, were non-supportive. We had um, filtered and, and autoclave yeast extracts, lowering the FBS and um, moving to 7.5% of yeast extracts. We find that 
uh, they stopped performing well, right? At 5% in the previous slide, quite okay. Um, but moving to 7.5%, we see uh, a lot more cell death and a overall decrease in uh, the cell numbers over here. And, you know, this project was discontinued. And personally, uh, in the lab, we do feel that um, the plant extracts we have uh, tend to outperform um, these yeast extracts, which were kindly uh, provided to us uh, uh, for evaluation from a uh, close collaborator. Uh, we have a um, LCMS uh, system uh, in um, Nanyang Polytechnic using the Shimatsu platform. It's a media analysis package which comes in very handy. It's good to look at uh, how our different plant serums uh, stack up in terms of their nutrient, micronutrient uh, content. And this uh, approach allows us to simultaneously an analyze about 150 uh, typical media compounds, which you, you, which you would find in most uh, medium uh, formulations today. So um, using this approach, we are able to pick up subtle changes uh, you know, between um, basal media and the different um, plant uh, and the different plant serums, whether or not certain uh, compounds are upregulated or, or you know, decrease in concentration. So it's a pretty uh, useful way uh, a useful approach um, for analyzing uh, the composition um, of uh, plant serum media. It's a complex task uh, because there's so many things inside, uh, but this is one way in which we have found, uh, one way in which we feel that um, it does help quite a bit, right, in, in making some sense and getting some empirical uh, uh, data to support uh, or, 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 you know, or reject the performance of a particular media formula, plant media formulation. It doesn't uh, detect lipids. Uh, lipids are not inside this particular package. So we, we, we did send out some of our better performing uh, plant substitutes for lipid analysis. And on the left of this figure here is essentially the uh, canonical uh, omega-3 fatty acid synthesis pathway. So um, ALA or alpha linoleic um, acid is a precursor for uh, the well-known uh, omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA. So we, we sent out, and it's used as a precursor for their, their EPA and DHA biosynthesis. So we sent out some of our best performing plant serum substitutes. Of course, we did not expect any EPA and DHA in them, uh, but we did find that certain plant um, media are indeed quite rich in um, uh, linolenic acid content. And this may augur well for seafood cultivated cell lines in, in the future because, um, you know, we do suspect that omega-3 content may be a uh, limiting nutritional factor of cell cultivated uh, uh, seafood. So perhaps um, supplementation with some of this uh, plant media that's rich in alpha linoleic acid could help improve the omega-3 content in cultivated uh, seafood cell lines. So our plant media work so far has focused on whole right, um, plant extracts. Moving forward, uh, we want to focus on specific protein isolate fractions uh, to gain a better understanding and a more uh, data uh, and a more um, empirical uh, understanding of uh, what is really important in that um, extract, which is composed of comprised of a, a lot of different compounds. So we are looking here at um, focusing on specific protein isolates from the supportive PDS samples in our previous screens on the grouper cell on the, on the fish cell lines, and we have developed a low cost extraction strategy which gives um, high yield of plant protein, and we are currently assessing various protein isolates for their culture media performance. And these protein fractions also show quite high solubility, which is an important factor in media development. And in the future, uh, we, are, we are paying um, closer attention to the low molecular weight uh, plant albumin fractions uh, for this part of the work. So screens are ongoing, different um, protein isolates on our cell lines currently. So apart from albumin, um, the other serum protein, which is uh, at very high concentrations, is transferrin. And tra transferrin and albumin are present in serum at, you know, probably about 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 5 times higher concentrations than your average growth factor. So can we 
also uh, you know, derive alternative transferrins from plants or algae. Um, there is some evidence to suggest that there are indeed putative um, trans analog uh, plant and algae transferrin analogs, and this is based on a some in silico analysis that's available online, a Markov model. So in this analysis, um, you know, based on the domain, protein domain, and and uh, structure analysis, right, homology analysis. Um, it's picked out several plant species, particularly those from uh, beans like chickpea and soybean, which incidentally are also among our best performing sources of uh, media substitutes. And um, there is evidence to suggest that these bees may indeed contain plant transference, right? However, um, the delivery of iron into cells, uh, transferrin delivery is a receptor mediated process, which is quite well described. Um, and we're not sure at this point if uh, you know it would a, 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 a plant alternative transferrin analog would work on the vertebrate cell because of the receptor ligand interaction um, and other considerations. So it's something that we want to uh, look at, and we've uh, drafted up a way a proposal in which to screen for these plant derived alternative transferrin or LG uh, alternative transferrins and submitted this uh, for uh, at a recent grant call. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to get funded for this work as well, in addition to the work that we are doing on plant-derived albumins. So moving on to uh, the last part of my presentation, and that is on hydrogels and fish collagen scaffolds. So for our hydrogel work, the motivations are essentially to show proof of developing a uh, uh, Hydrogel, which can self-assemble, uh, which is uh, preferably also removable from the cell mass and uh, which is non-toxic, edible in nature. So we looked at um, small peptide molecules or dipeptide molecules, which can self-assemble to give a hydrogel matrix. And this contrasts with polymeric hydrogels. Right, um, we believe that it would be quite difficult to remove uh, the polymeric hydrogel from a, you know the cell mass that's growing on it. So we looked at um, developing proof of concept that uh, small dipeptides uh, of this structure could produce and assemble, uh, self-assemble, right into into hydrogels. So this is what we thought of right an intricate balance of hydro uh, of hydrogelation. So we uh, chemist colleague of mine, very good chemist colleague, he's um, made in the lab a variety of dipeptide molecules which can form hydrogels, and which can also transition from the solid state to the liquid state by changing uh, the water content in these gels. So in theory, if we have a cell mass that's growing on a gel like this. And if we increase the water content, the gel would liquefy quite easily. So no heating required, no solvents or any other approaches required. Just increase the water content. And because these gels are non-polymeric, they're made of self-assembled dipeptides like this, uh, they would dissociate and liquefy. thus enabling us to harvest the cell mass and you know, uh, doing away uh, with the hydrogel in the final, uh, you know, cell mass that's uh, going to be made into a food product. So he developed a solid phase uh, synthesis method to produce a series of dipeptide molecules. And in terms of the requirements for hydrogelation, um, the purity of the hydrogel is very important. So these dipeptides need to be of sufficient purity, analytical grade purity. Ionic strength is also important. As I mentioned, if we increase the water content, the gels will dissolve. So we use, but they do form in a standard PBS uh, buffer, right? Standard PBS concentration, PBS buffer. Concentration of the hydrogel, about 0.4 to 0.7% weight per volume. But one of the major limiting factors, although the gels do perform uh, relatively well, I must say, is that the cost of these dipeptides are actually 
uh, too high, unfortunately. So the pictures over here at the bottom of the slide show fish cells which have been seeded on a dipeptide hydrogel, 18 hours post-seeding. So they do attach, spread out. We can also incorporate RGD groups um, into the hydrogels to improve attachment. You may be wondering what the capping groups and R groups, the identity of the capping groups and R groups are. And, and so I can disclose them. Um, these are the uh, chemical structures of what our capping groups look like and the different R groups enabling uh, this dipeptide to self-assemble to form a hydrogel. So earlier on, we also wanted to uh, understand whether p sign cells would grow well on these peptidic hydrogels. So we um, did a screen on some of these um, peptide hydrogel formulations um, in a, um, and we plated fish cells on it, observed the morphology, and we did use the resagerin uh, dye, which is essentially a cell viability assay to understand if uh, cells growing on these gels would indeed proliferate or would they cease to divide. So we do find that uh, compared to controls, plastic, tissue culture, plastic, no gels, we do find that there are some gels which perform quite well, whereas others, um, essentially, uh, the cells don't quite like them. Uh, they stop growing and stop proliferation. But as I said, uh, we put this project on the back burner because of the cost of these dipeptide molecules. For the longest time, we were looking for a lower cost substitute. Um, actually, the, the cost factors do drive quite a bit of our R&D in the school. Um, unable to, to find any um, lower cost alternative, unfortunately. So moving on in this space, uh, we are also looking at um, microbial polysaccharides like gelin gum and xanthan gum. So uh, this is work that's ongoing. I don't have uh, much data to share on this yet, but gelin gum uh, does form a... Um, hydrogel at 1%, probably, uh, whereas a xanthan gum at 2% might be better to use a lower percentage hydrogel if it can work, uh, rather than something that's of uh, you know, higher concentration, because I don't think you know, we would want to ingest uh, too much of this with the, uh, food per with, with the cells eventually. So we can also incorporate RGD groups. Uh, it's work that's ongoing, and I hope to be able to share data on this uh, in the near future. And finally, um, this is work done by another uh, chemist, that we, whom, uh, very good chemist that we have in our school. Uh, we are also looking at low-cost approaches to valorize fish skin and here fish scales and to extract collagen from these you know, products which are discarded from food, uh, fish uh, processing plants, for example. So he's developed a way in which to extract um, collagen from fish scales. It's a low cost method, I believe it's three to four dollars per gram. And the yield is decent at 11.6% of collagen yield, um, weight for weight uh, of fish scales. And we've used this uh, as a attachment substrate uh, for some of our fish cells as well. The earlier work I showed you on collagen was essentially collagen from uh, these, uh, the valorized collagen that's here. Um, but as I mentioned, laminin still seems to be uh, the better performer in terms of uh, uh, producing and, and giving rise to more mature, thicker muscle fibers. So in summary then, uh, what we have currently is about 10 uh, fish cell lines uh, from food fish. And some of these lines are capable of muscle cell differentiation even after 12 population doublings. Eight lines have undergone spontaneous uh, immortalization and we've managed to adapt several to low serum conditions with plant extract supplementation. Supportive plant isolates maintain the growth of these fish cells for many passages over 25 and in reduced uh, serum conditions following ad adaptation. And some plant isolates are rich in omega-3 fatty acids, particularly ALA, and these may be useful downstream for supporting the growth of um, aquatic species cell lines in order to enrich for omega-3. So we do have several uh, hydrogel, edible hydrogel formulations which support uh, fish cell line attachment and growth, but these peptide precursors are too costly and probably unsuitable for you know, any form of scale-up currently. And we're now evaluating microbial polysaccharides as attachment substrates. Low-cost collagen extraction method at less than three grams, uh, Singapore dollars three, gra uh, three dollars per gram has been made and we have filed a patent for some of these serum replacements and 
um, are in talks to license some of our cell lines. In the future, this is what we hope to do. I think um, a lot of effort will be placed on looking at alternative plant and LG-derived albumins and transferins to further the work on low-cost culture media development. Um, I think ultimately we have to look at single cell cloning and of course suspension culture adaptation and maybe even fast growing phenotypes in vitro. Nutritional value and omega-3 content is also on our horizon. And perhaps, you know, uh, we could also leverage ideas from conventional agriculture. Um, we, there are fast growing species and stress tolerant species with the genetics for that. Can these contribute to cell line development will, you know, the behavior with the phenotype in vitro be recapitulated? I'm not sure. Um, what about looking at animal feed and what goes into it? Can we have, can we um, obtain some ideas from animal feed um, compositions uh, for feedstock development and culture media? And, you know, we could also leverage ideas from stem cell regenerative medicine, not just on the technical bits and aspects, but also, you know, the safety considerations and aspects too. So with that, um, thank you very much. I think I'm just about time. And I'd like to acknowledge um, Dr. Lim Chun Kiet, who was working on this project and who has now joined Umami Meats as the group leader of cell line development. My chemistry colleagues, Chiwi and Subra, um, very talented chemist, um, my boss uh, and the director of the school, Joel Mihir, of course, uh, my close friend and collaborator, AP Chan from NUS and the Singapore Food Story, ASTAR, the Good Food Institute, Umami Meats and the uh, Singapore Food Agency for uh, their participation in this work. So thank you very much. I hope that my sharing um, was uh, interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. That was Thanks. a really uh, great and well-rounded presentation. There's so much work that still have to be done. And it seems like you've touched base on many of the aspects of cultivated meat work. Mm -hmm. um, so we already have a few questions coming in. Um, so the first question is, will these cell lines that your lab is working and developing be eventually made available for other researchers? Uh, yes, so um, we've been approached by the Chris Meats Consortium, which is the, um, uh, the, 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 the group that's focusing on uh, cultivated meat uh, science uh, in Singapore, and they have a cell bank up. Um, we've been approached to ask if you would like to deposit some of these cell lines there. We're still in talks, uh, so I think... Uh, there may be a possibility, but because um, there's also some commercial interest in these cell lines, uh, we would have to see, you know, which lines eventually end up in the, uh, I would say, the National Cell Bank that, single, that the Chris Beats uh, Institute is, uh, has uh, initiated. Uh, yeah. So I, I would say that some would be available. Yes. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, could you elaborate on how you culture or prepare the cells for culture in 3D suspension versus 2D modeling? Yeah, so yeah, that's a good question. So we have not really um, looked at uh, 3D suspension cultures at this point. So we are, the cells are essentially, uh, the, the hydrogels have been layered on uh, you know, uh, tissue culture plastic. So it's essentially... Um, you know, just several uh, uh, microns thick. So I would still consider, it's probably not a, a you know, a, a 3D um, structure that we have. It's still more or less a 2D monolayer. Um, yeah, so we, we layer the hydrogels on tissue in a, on a multi-well dish and we seed the cells on them. We do see that the cells actually um, grow into the hydrogel, right? So um, uh, yeah, but we have not, if the question is about, you know, using the hydrogels, uh, attaching cells on them, and then putting them in the suspension bioreactor, that's not what we have attempted. The expansion system, which I alluded to from Paul, which we use to scale up the cells, is, is essentially a multi-stack kind of device. The reactor is a multi-stack device uh, specifically meant for adherent cell culture. Yeah. So we have, we, have, we have not done the suspension work uh, in much detail yet. Yeah. Hope that helps. Thank you. 
Um, so this one question is regarding, I guess, um, probably a, a further research. So um, the uh, the question was the flavor of meat is also influenced by the animal's diet. So um, and also the enzymatic maturation and aging of meat, which could also alter the texture. Since the cultivated meat process involves growing muscle cell in a sterile and controlled environment, can it give these external factors to simulate a real meat? flavor yeah. experience yeah so this is a really interesting question um i i don't know really uh whether or not the the flavor of uh fish cells that which we culture will actually you know mimic that of uh you know real uh fish but um i think there's a possibility i hear that you know from the shrimp people that indeed there is uh, some kind of a uh, semblance uh, to real shrimp cells but um I think one way of uh, doing this is, you know, to have a uh, at least in 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 a in a in a conventional agriculture setting, uh, there's something called a finisher feed, and um, usually before market, uh, the farmer would feed their animals with this um, finisher feed, which is enriched sometimes uh, with a lot of oils, you know, to boost the flavor of the final fish product. So perhaps this is something we could do. Uh, adapt that idea in a cultivated meat setting you know um, in the in the final uh, uh, culture condition we may want to tweak the media to impart a flavor profile but of course this would um, you know entail a lot more work uh, downstream yeah so it's an interesting question which I think um, uh, will be need to be addressed very very soon yeah thank you thank you um, so the next question is, um, do cells from your other species exhibit similar differentiation efficiencies? Mm, so, sorry, is, is it the higher fat? Oh, the, the ALA oh, one? Yeah, ah, okay, the, okay, yeah. the, the bottom one, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, so um, it's a, it's a great question. We've not really looked at cell line conversion of the ALA. So this, what I showed was essentially uh, the ALA content in the, in, in, in the, in the plant serum, uh, in the plant uh, extract. So um, I know that, um, uh, yeah, so we've not really looked at the omega-3 content in our cells yet. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. but, but it's something that I think um, there are other labs in Singapore who are addressing this question um, we have seen presentations from professor shigeki's lab shigeki prof shigeki is also in in this audience today so uh, it's um, it's and he's presented some data on this conversion so i think prof shigeki might be the uh, the, the real person to go to uh, you know to get some uh, information on, on this question yeah i really like how all the researcher in singapore is very well connected <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yes. Um, so uh, the next question is from Jose uh, Burgos. Yeah. Um, he's a th thesis student in cell ag agriculture in yeah. Chile, and I'm working yeah. with zebra fish, and I have very yeah about yeah. the most yeah. So the about the protocol, the right? Collagenase yeah. and the setting yeah. time of the muscle yeah. cell to either yeah. treated or untreated. Yeah. Yes. So. Yeah, so that that's a it's a great question. It's a, you know, it's about the protocol. I'd be happy to share some of the uh, uh, protocols we have with Jose. So I uh, I have a figure in my mind, but I'm not sure if it's uh, the right one. So I better not uh, say at this point. Yeah, better not say. But I would be more than happy to share uh, you know some of the protocols with you, Jose. Thanks for the question. Thank you very much. You can contact me. I think um, you know. Uh, I didn't put my email on any of the slides, but uh, you can just look me up. I'm sure you can find me. Yeah, certainly. Um, so I have this question that I think is very relevant to many people. Um, mm -hmm. So the question is on the, the the supplementation of the serum with the plant based derived serum. Um, so how significant is the cost reduction when cell line is adapted to proliferate in 1% FCS and 9% PDS mm -hmm. compared to 10% FCS alone? How significant is the cost reduction? Right. Yeah, so um, this is a, is, is a good question, but you know, um, we've um, 
removed already 90% of the, the calf serum cost if let's say if we go with 1% FCS and we probably can push this down further. Um, I have some figures uh, <laughs> out there, but uh, you know, off the top of my head, we did we did do some um, calculations on, on cost reduction. Uh, I I don't I'm if it's you know I, I don't have it off the top of my head right now, but I'm I I do have some calculations and you know I, I could share on this, but uh, you know removing the serum alone would be I think um, would constitute uh, quite a reasonable and you know substantial uh, uh, you know uh, uh, cost reduction already I mean moving from 10 percent to one percent yeah but we, we have done some proper calculations and I would love to share those calculations with you uh, but I don't have them off the top of my head right now yeah thank you so I think um, you've already Oysters? answered the question yeah. from Dr. Shigeki. Yeah, yeah. And the cost yeah. consideration. Yeah. So I think um, actually the, the, the cost, yeah, we have those. It's uh probably works out to I don't know, just uh, less than if I do have it. Uh just we, we have we have some figures, so I, I better not uh you know uh, make the wrong uh, commit to the wrong figure right now, but we do have uh it's probably not less than one dollar per ml, which some companies are claiming. Uh, you know, some people are claiming, so uh, it's a little bit higher, but, you know, it's not, it's still, a, I would say, a, quite a, a reduction in terms of cost, yeah. Yep. yeah. Um, and I think we're going to only have time for maybe one last sure. question. Um, yeah. Mm. So I think this one is uh, probably quite important. In the cell line development, what kind of phenotype would there, would be the most important to produce a final product for food? Mm. Yeah. Um, phenotype as in uh, you know, the, the composition. Can I just uh you know understand uh cell you know, looking at specific features which enable uh you know more robust growth, or is it the um or does the question relate to the type, uh cell type uh that would go into a food product? Uh yeah. In cell line development, what kind of phenotypes would be the most important? Okay, so well, well, I I know that um at the moment, right? Um, I think at least in in the you know the early stages of this field, uh, most of the the products would probably be a blend of you know plant based protein and cultivated cells. So, uh, the form of these products will also probably take on. Uh, the shape, you know, of uh, a, a patty-like structure. Um, fibroblasts grow well, very efficiently. Uh, they provide uh, sufficient biomass. Um, we need to get a clone, um, a myoblast clone, which can efficiently differentiate. You know, uh, we have not uh, got that clone yet, but if we could have all muscle, that would be great as well, right? And um, but at this point in time, I think uh, fibroblasts give us. Um, uh, you know, the cell numbers necessary to, to for tasting sessions, uh, for sensory evaluation. Moving forward, you know, if we could have more muscle, better fat cells, also important for flavor. Um, I, yeah, so I, I think um, that's, uh, you know, I think it would be that fat and, and, and muscle and with some fibroblasts to make up the, um, the, the majority of the cell mass. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Uh, so oh, I think that will probably be our last question. Uh, okay. For those that um, we really apologize for the question that hasn't been answered. If you are again interested in to know more, we leave Dr. Mark contacts in the chat box. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you can reach out to him. And thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, so make sure that if you have other questions for Mark, you can reach him at Mark Richards. Um, at nyp.edu.sg. Um, thank you again, Mark, for coming to join us today. And we're happy thank you. to have you and learn more about your advance when you do more of this research. Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation. And thanks, everyone, for the uh, very stimulating questions. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Have a thank day.